Hello, everybody. Uh, as Janice said, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you from uh, all over the world. And I'm delighted to be here for the latest in our Innovation at Work uh, webinar series, including for the first time in several months, the return of our 60 minute deep dive format, uh, which gives us time to really get further into the subject matter than our 30 minute need to know series that we've been running all through the summer. And it's very fitting that I'm joined today by uh, my colleague, senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School and a member of the exec ed team, Paul McDonough Smith, who's going to talk to us about his work uh, and the programs that he's developing in the areas of algorithmic business thinking, implications and applications for your teams. We're delighted so many of you have joined us uh, for this uh, session. I think that that uh, really tells us something about how timely and important this topic is. And I'm delighted to say that Paul is really a fantastic expert to help us work through uh, this question. He's a digital capability leader at the MIT Sloan School of Management's Executive Education uh, Organization, uh, which we're all part of. Uh, he's uh, had a long uh, and distinguished career in industry before coming back into academia and, and, and education. And he continues to drive innovation for us at the Sloan School in how we use technology, not only in executive education, uh, but really the interfaces between technology and human beings uh, in everything uh, really that we do. Uh, he teaches in a number of our programs, but he's actually the expert behind many more that his name does not actually explicitly appear on. So thank you, Paul, for all that you do uh, for bringing, uh, helping us uh, really be in the digital uh, world and thank you for joining us. And today what Paul is uh, going to cover uh, is going to define this, uh, this concept for us and share uh, some examples to help us understand it. Uh, and perhaps more, most important of all, he's actually really going to help us uh, understand how we can apply this way of thinking and these techniques uh, in our own organizations and in our own businesses. This is going to be very interactive, uh, as Janice mentioned, so please feel free uh, to ask questions in the Q&A uh, so that I'm able to put some of those to Paul uh, and we will be asking for some input and feedback uh, through polls and through the chat as well uh, as we go along. So with that, I'd like to first of all hand over to Paul uh, to help us understand what is algorithmic business thinking, uh, why should we care and what can we do about it? Well, well it's great, Peter, to, to start with a question, of, of course. Uh, so, so important to frame our questions carefully and with consideration. Uh, ju just before we get into uh, today's discussion, uh, simply wanted to thank, uh, thank you and thank the team for the introduction. And in particular, thank everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, thank everybody for taking time to join us today for what you uh, kind of correctly positioned as a, an interactive discussion around the topic of algorithmic business thinking. Okay, so let's, um, Let's, let's, let's get started then. So in his IAP uh, class, Patrick Winston, back in 2018, um, in fact, Patrick Winston, the greatly missed and pioneering MIT professor, said that it's not such a good idea to start a presentation with a joke. He kind of warned that people aren't really prepared for them uh, and that they can fall very flat. Instead, he said that you should tell people what, you're going to, what they're going to know at the end of the hour and make sure that you make some form of an empowerment promise and save all of your jokes for the end. So I'm going to follow that advice. You know, if it's good enough for, if it was good enough for Patrick Winston, I'm sure it's good enough for me. So if I forget to kind of tell a joke um, um, during this presentation, please remind me at the end and I'm sure I've got one kind of stored for you. So what is the empowerment uh, promise here? The, the actual promise I'd like to make or the commitment is that over the next 45 minutes or so, you will learn or be reminded at least of things related to algorithmic business thinking that will help you make a positive impact in your teams or organizations. So as a starting point, I'm going to reference a, a, a presentation, in fact, a hackathon that Peter, the team and I ran about 18 months ago with Unicon. Uh, Unicon is the largest consortium of business schools in, in the world. And we, we held a, a hackathon, a 24 hour hackathon, fundamentally based on helping executives to hack their businesses with technology, pr 
primarily AI and machine learning. Um, this 24 hour hackathon was, was actually a good example of, of something that we have here in front of us, this particular slide around inputs, outputs and the process in the middle. So as with any solution, when we were planning for this hackathon, we, we had to actually think about our specific inputs and outputs. The input of course being what we put in, what's operated on by the process and the output being what's produced, what's delivered or supplied by the process or system. So in, in terms of the input for our hackathon, we had in the range of 100, 120 so executives. Um, the vast, vast majority had little or in fact no technical coding or programming experience. I think it's fair to say they were perhaps a little bit nervous, intimidated and perhaps even a little self-conscious about actually getting started with, with coding and, and, and hacking. Now, the, the process we actually put in place was to actually allow the participants in, in that hackathon to actually work with technologies, get their hands dirty, roll up their sleeves, something we do very often at MIT, of course, and I'm sure you do in your organizations. We help them look underneath the bonnet of key technologies. They um, actually wrote algorithms, they coded them, they ran them, they improved them, they actually built some apps and actually then took all of those ideas into a hackathon where they were actually asked to disrupt their existing business, to look at their challenges and use the lessons we taught them to deconstruct them a little bit and then put them back together with uh, new opportunities that they could use in their teams. Now, the lessons we learned actually from that Unicorn Hackathon had, had a big effect upon us as a team. It wasn't the fact that yes, over the space of 24 hours, um, participants were able to get up and running uh, with a little bit of coding and a little bit of uh, writing apps, et cetera. It was actually more to do with the enablement and the empowerment that we saw at the end of the experience. It became very clear to us that something kind of magical and kind of inspiring was happening here that by giving people the ability, by opening these doors for them, they were actually able to get a new confidence as well as a little bit of capability that they could take back into their teams. Now, this is a bit of a black and white slide, so add a little bit of color. During that hackathon, we introduced and took them into virtual worlds that we had built. We got them playing around with AR and VR kind of headsets. This is HoloLens, uh, me in Bilbao. Um, we actually, got them playing around with robots. They did uh, an exercise called robot racing, which I seem to remember Peter's team, in fact, may have, may have actually have won. But all the joking aside, it was a very important exercise to give people the opportunity to, to start to learn about a world that perhaps they had felt was closed, closed off to them. Now, as we actually, as, as we actually kind of took a step back after that hackathon, we, we, we thought a little bit about what were the actual cornerstones of computational thinking that we, that we felt were gonna be very important for our business audiences. And fundamentally, we kind of settled on the four that you can see here. There, there are lots of others that will reference as we go through today's presentation. But these four techniques, these four co cornerstones, uh, I, I'd just like to take a moment to share these with you. That the first one, de decomposition. Uh, reduction, breaking down a complex problem or system into smaller, more manageable problems. And then if necessary, breaking those down again into even smaller chunks until you can find a problem you can work with, uh, fix and kind of then recombine. Pattern recognition, looking for similarities among and within problems. Abstraction in the bottom, bottom left there, focusing on the important information only ignoring the irre irrelevant details. And then algorithms in the, in the final box there on the right, developing a step-by-step -step solution to the problem, all the rules to follow to solve the problem that you have in front of you. Now, I'd like to argue, or like to suggest at least, that algorithmic business thinking bridges these four techniques into your business context and realities. It does so to enable you to get transformative technology actually working for you in your teams and across your company more broadly. And so in today's webinar, we're gonna show you how to build these bridges and take advantages of the benefits that the four techniques you saw on the previous slide will bring to your, to your teams and organization. 
So before we go any further, let's, let's just take a few moments to define what we might actually mean by algorithmic business thinking. Marvin Minsky, the MIT AI pioneer, coined the term suitcase words. And I, I think this is a, a pretty good way to visualize and to think about algorithmic business thinking, which has a lot packed into it. So the working definition that we have here is that algorithmic business thinking is a series of smart questions, insights and frameworks that allow us to understand today's business challenges, deconstruct them, and then put them back together as opportunities for sustainable growth in the digital economy that we're all kind of working further in today. ABT represents a universally applicable attitude and skill set that I think everyone in business can learn and use. In our teams and organizations, it represents an opportunity to translate computer science into practical business value. At times, it's about parallel processing, using abstraction and decomposition when faced with large complex tasks or designing a large complex system, for example. It can be about separation of concerns, choosing an appropriate representation for a problem or modeling the relevant aspects of a problem to make it more workable. It's about having the confidence to use, to modify, to influence a large complex system without thinking you need to understand its every painful detail. Algorithmic business thinking is about evaluating your projects, not just for effectiveness and efficiency, but also for aesthetics, respecting simplicity and quiet elegance in your designs. I would also say that in our companies, algorithmic business thinking importantly is about prevention, about protection, about recovery from worst case scenarios through things like redundancy, damage containment and error correction. It's planning, it's learning and it's delivering in the presence of uncertainty. Now this is a key point in the presence of uncertainty. And we'll talk a little bit later about the ways in which algorithmic business thinking can help you move past some of the paralysis of uncertainty and actually get you doing the next things that can help you in your teams, frankly, personally, as well as in your businesses. I would also say that algorithmic business thinking is about framing and fixing leadership and management problems, bringing the power of computational thinking to bear on the business problems you have in front of you. <laughs> it's about threading needles. It's about how the thinking we apply in a range of everyday tasks can be harnessed in our teams. For, for example, think about the last time you lost your car keys, for me, last Saturday, and you retraced your steps. When you were doing this, you were backtracking. When you change lanes on the motorway in the hope that you'll get somewhere a little bit more quickly, we're performance modeling. Why does your phone work when there's a power outage? That's independence of failure and redundancy in design. We know that machine learning has transformed statistics our research activities across all industries and, and, and all fields are benefiting from machine learning and AI related advances. The sciences, biology, chemistry, physics have adopted a number of these techniques to incredibly significant effect, but so have the humanities and the arts. In fact, I'd go as far as to say, it's hard to think of a field that hasn't and won't continue to be positively impacted by the concepts I'm, I'm suggesting are at the heart of algorithmic business thinking. But to bring it back to, to business, in our teams and companies, algorithmic business thinking represents an opportunity to explore, to experiment, and to evolve our team's skill sets and their mindsets. It's not just what they're doing, but also how they're thinking about it. Wherever or whenever we have a big data problem, for example, I would suggest we have an opportunity for algorithmic business thinking. The bottom line, I suppose, is that I think it's about human, not computer thinking. And it's potentially useful for anyone who has a business problem to fix and frame. But before we go any further into, into kind of talking about algorithmic business thinking, I think we should perhaps just take a, a few minutes 
to talk about where we actually are with technology today. So you can see the slide here in front of you, where we are today and a little bit about how we got here. So now that we've introduced this idea of algorithmic business thinking, we've spoken a little bit about what it is and, and shared a, a working definition. Let's, let's, think in about, let's think about kind of where we actually are. So whenever today we think about building the teams, the organizations, the institutions, cities, society of tomorrow, we invariably look in the direction of technology to lend us a helping hand, don't we? Our, our visions, we could argue, are shaped by the algorithms that run in code on our computers, laptops, and those smartphones on, on, on our desks. But we often take technology for granted. Let's think and reflect for a moment about where we are. And I think there are, there are two particularly interesting concepts that can help us understand and kind of make sense of those two questions. The, the first, and perhaps the better known, is Moore's Law, which is an expansion of an observation made by Gordon Moore, the, the, the chap in the picture here, co-founder of microprocessor maker Intel. Back in 1965, in an article in Electronics magazine, Moore noted that the number of transistors in a minimum cost integrated circuit had been doubling every 12, 12 months or so, and predicted that this same rate of improvement would continue into the future. When this proved to be the case, Moore's law was born. Now, variations of Moore's law have been applied to improvement over time in disk drive capacity, display resolution, network bandwidth, and, and lots of other things. The second concept that I think is relevant for understanding recent computing advances is closely related to Moore's law. It comes from an ancient story about mathematics made relevant to the present age by the innovator and futurist Ray Kurzweil. In one version of the story, the inventor of the game of chess shows his creation to his country's ruler. The emperor is so delighted by the game that he allows the inventor to name his own reward. Now the inventor is a clever man and he asks for a quantity of rice to be determined as follows. One grain of rice is placed on the first square of a chessboard, two grains on the second, four on the third, and, and so on and so on, with each square receiving twice as many grains as the previous one. The emperor agrees, thinking that this reward was way too small. He eventually sees, however, that the constant doubling results in tremendously large numbers. In fact, the inventor winds up with a pile bigger than Mount Everest. In some versions of the story, the emperor is so displeased at being outsmarted that he beheads the inventor. Um, note to everybody, a cautionary note, uh, nobody really truly likes a smart Alec, okay? So in his 2000 book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, When Computers Exceed Human Intelligence, Kurzweil notes that the pile of rice isn't that exceptional on the first half of the chessboard. After 32 squares, the emperor had given the inventor about four billion grains of rice. Sounds a lot. It's a reasonable quantity of rice, about one large field. And the emperor, I think it's fair to say, did start to take notice. But the emperor could still remain the boss. And importantly, the inventor could still retain his head. It was only as they moved into the second half of the chessboard that at least one of them was likely to get into serious trouble. So for over 50 years now, the number of transistors you can put on a chip has been doubling roughly about every 18 to 24 months. And that means that the power of computing that you can get for a dollar has fundamentally, in essence, been dropping by 50% year in and year out. To use chemistry terminology for a moment, catalyst might be a good word to describe Moore's law. I'd also say it's probably one of the most important things that's been happening in the global economy over the past half a century. But, or and, it brings up an interesting point. Moore's law has been going on for more than half a century, but we're only just seeing all of these incredible science fiction-like technologies. Self-driving cars, computer chess champions, Go, um, AlphaGo, computer poker champions. Why, why is that? Let's do a little calculation, perhaps. If we were to look up when the United States government started tracking this newfangled thing called information technology as a category for a business to invest in, we would see that 1958 was the first time we saw the words information technology referenced in the national statistics. 
If we were to take that on the back of an envelope as a, as a starting date and use maybe a year and a half as the doubling period to have a sense of when we entered the second half of the chessboard, we would actually see that it was in about 2006, 2007 that we entered the second half of the technology chessboard. Now, as I said, I accept that this is a bit of a back of an envelope type of calculation, and maybe we shouldn't read too much into it. But that said, on one hand, maybe it does help us understand the smartphone era, self-driving cars, drones, computer go, all of these things that have happened since 2006 and 2007. We might even go as far as suggest that they're actually second half of the chessboard technologies. It may, in fact, only be no more than a directional type of observation, but, but I think it's also a very serious one because people say, well, Moore's law just keeps doubling. Why are we suddenly seeing this takeoff? And yes, we've had millions and even billions of transistors on a chip, but the truth is now we're getting to astronomical numbers and we're going and getting well beyond what most of us are used to comprehending. It's not just a few fields worth of rice. We're getting powers in computers that were never seen before. I think Kurzweil's point is that constant doubling reflecting exponential growth is deceptive because it's initially quite unremarkable. Exponential increases initially look a lot like standard linear ones, but they're not. A an observation that's been very tragically hammered home over the COVID period to us, that difference um, between linear and exponential increases. But if we were to couple that observation with the calculation, um, we might, as I say, suggest that we're actually on the second half of the chessboard. And if that actually happens to be the case, we might reasonably say, wow, we haven't seen anything yet. And we should look to fasten our metaphorical seatbelts for quite a technology ride over the next years and, and months even ahead of us. I think it also implies that the role of technology will become increasingly central to considerations around how we manage, lead, and strategize in our organizations. So if we accept that our visions of tomorrow are shaped by algorithms, then thinking about how best to convert those visions to reality with relevant management and leadership approaches seems like a good reason to be having this chat today. So we've spoken a little bit now about where we are, and I've tried to give a suggestion as to how we actually got here. But what does all of that, or any of that, in fact, mean with regards to algorithmic business thinking? Now, in order to answer that question, I'd like to start by looking at the characteristics and principles of the digital networks that connect us today, because I, th I think that might give us some clues with regard to the relevance of the ideas packed into our algorithmic business thinking suitcase that, that we mentioned earlier. Networks are a fundamental pattern of life. Wherever we see life, we also see networks. When networks change shape, so do the structures, systems, and institutions of our societies. For, for example, in agrarian society, networks were predominantly local, orbiting around a local radius of workplace, place of worship, and family home often all within a 10 kilometer type of radius. In the industrial society, the gravitational pull of cities resulted in individuals and often entire families relocating within the same or different countries. Networks in industrial societies were more geographically dispersed. Henry Ford's production line philosophy didn't just deliver affordable cars, but influenced almost a one size fits all approach to manufacturing, media, education, leadership, management at times, that's overturned in today's digital economy. His comment that people can have the Model T Ford in any color, as long as it's black, is super outdated in a world where we're moving from mass production to mass personalization, mass communication on our way to mass collaboration. I would argue that our world isn't flat or round. It shapeshifts dynamically based on the networks and flows we activate to share and receive information and experiences. Electricity crackles with, with the emotion of the, way in, the ways in which we all interact with each other. We're local, we're global. We're often our own media as we spread our lives across all of these computer networks. 
governed by a different set of physics than the carbon world we grew up in. Now, I think today, the activities that shape and sculpt human life are largely organized in these global digital networks. Against this backdrop, in the same way that previous industrial revolutions changed our systems, I think we need to change the way we live, work and think in the digital economy, or perhaps even an algorithmic one, if we might call it that. As, we, as we've moved, or as we continue to move through the squares of the technology chessboard, I think, I think the role of algorithms is being pushed further into the core of our lives and the organizations and systems we interface within. The industrial revolution was just that, wasn't it? It was revolutionary because it ran into a worldview that wasn't ready for it. Today, we don't see invention or technology as an accidental thing. We actively, deliberately plan and manage for it. We foster and nurture it as a natural production line to new practices. And my point here is that I think we're far enough along on the chessboard to think that technology has come of age and it's completely centrally linked to the way that we live and work. We need to explore new places, new spaces, new possibilities. We need to experiment towards new experiences and evolve our teams and organizations so that we can take advantage of the, um, of the opportunities the digital economy brings us. And I think algorithmic business thinking actually helps us with all of those things. The reality for our teams and organizations, I think today is that, that we need to mind the gaps, <laughs> the, the gaps created in our workforce and business strategies. In order to move forward from possibilities to opportunities, to choices, to action. We need new skills in new people and places in newly accelerated timeframes. But critically, in addition to these new skills, we also need new ways of thinking about our business challenges. And this is where algorithmic business thinking is, I think, very useful and impactful. It can help us understand our challenges, break them down, and then recombine them inspired by the questions, insights, and frameworks. That, that we've identified, uh, and in fact, that we teach in the six week program that we're launching in, in January. The way that we thought and worked in the industrial economy simply won't work effectively enough for us in the digital one. We need to evolve the systems that are at the same or closer to the pH level of the world that exists around us. And I think that algorithmic business thinking and applying some of the things we've already spoken about will actually help you build not just the capability to do so, but the confidence to try to, okay? Now, how effectively you think and act will have a major kind of, uh, a major determination on how effectively we can actually deal with those very real challenges we have in front of us. So just like the refrain on the London Underground, when stepping into the digital economy, please mind the gap, that gap, between the industrial and digital economy, between how your teams and organizations need to think about work, about tasks, about jobs, the gap between how you need to lead and manage yourself and the teams, and the strategies you need to build and implement to bridge our industrial past with digital present and future. You'll also need to mind the gap between your business and your customers' expectations, between the different levels of your organization. So let's talk a little bit about ABT in action. Having set some of the context that I've just spoken about around how we, where we are today with technology, how we got here, what that might mean, um, what algorithmic business thinking kind of looks like and, and a working, a working uh, definition. Let's, let's spend the next few minutes talking about some actual examples of algorithmic business thinking in play. So, here we go, everybody. 3.30 a.m., yeah? In the dead of night. And for me, for some reason, it's generally at 3.30. The ghost, the ghost of business problems, past, present, and future um, comes to visit us, yeah? You know that feeling. Uh, <laughs> your, your bed sheets almost take on an icy kind of uh, sheen. The pillows harden, yeah? as you feel kind of overcome with the uncertainties and the unknowns 
aspects of your business challenges. Um, okay, so I, I might be positioning this kind of somewhat kind of jokingly, but uh, I'm not going to ask you to kind of answer uh, on the chat here, but um, just reflect for a moment and, and think about the last time or the frequency, in fact, perhaps, with which you actually wake up at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning thinking about business problems. Um, of course, as, as I'm kind of the person talking here, <laughs> I, th I think I, I should be honest about this as well and say, this isn't kind of irregular for, for me personally to have this kind of experience. And um, when, when, when it does happen, I've found that, frankly, uh, almost an algorithmic or a computational thinking approach has actually helped me out and helped me get back to sleep, if you will. So what I'd like to share here is a very real problem, but, but also a very real, a, a real, a real framework and, and a real way of thinking that can help us kind of overcome this. So while it's kind of sometimes difficult to, 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 to get, to, to kind of find a bit of calmness when you have these problems, I find that the techniques, including problem reduction, decomposition, abstraction, provide me with an important sense of perspective and a positive starting point when, when we have these types of challenges. It almost allows, allows me to kind of zoom in and zoom out of problems. It's almost like that pointillism kind of uh, thing where when you stand too close to the mosaic, you can't make out the picture, but when you're able to take a few steps backwards, everything comes into focus. And, and, and I think the UDAP uh, framework that's mentioned here developed by our colleague, uh, MIT colleague, Professor Thomas Malone, is an example of a framework that I think is helpful in the context of this 330 problem. And also, I think, in fact, not just in, in terms of um, technology and IT types of problems, it's actually a useful model for a, a broad range of kind of challenges. Now, you will have seen already that the name stands for the five elements you need to identify in a given situation. Uh, objective, options, dimensions, analysis, proposal. Firstly, uh, the objective, identify the problem or objective in the situation. Often the true problem from an IT perspective is buried in jargon and peripheral types of issues. Continue asking the questions until the underlying objective is clear and then restate it to check for agreement. Options, uh, the second point here. Identify options, alternative actions or choices in a situation. Often additional uh, options will surface when you consider the dimensions and analysis that, that comes next. Dimensions, yeah, this is about identifying the evaluation criteria that will influence the decision. In IT related decisions, the following factors are kind of often critical. Time, um, development time, speed of operation, etc. Development costs, labor, recruiting, training costs usage costs, hardware, software, training, implementation, risks, um, downtime, disaster recovery, security risks, usability, compatibility, flexibility, scalability, reusability, and in fact, lots of other abilities are actually super important here when you're actually considering the dimensions. Then you get into anal analysis and using the options and dimensions, you can create almost a trade-off matrix like the one you can see on the slide um, here. Just a, a little note, often the easiest way to fill in the cells is just with high, medium and low types of scoring. This, this provides a framework to analyze the pros and cons of each option and to consider the relative importance of critical dimensions. So that leads you then into proposal and often the analysis helps you select a best option to propose. If not, at the very least, it should help you to identify the critical uncertainties that still need to be resolved and in doing so, hopefully get us all back to sleep um, so that we're nice and fresh for the, for the next morning. So a an, next example of algorithm business thinking here is hiring as exploration. Now, a traditional approach to, to, to hiring, um, we, we've seen or we see companies increasingly turn to algorithms to help with recruitment and hiring decisions. They, they hold the promise of saving firms time um, they can process thousands of applications much, much faster than a human recruiter could, and also potentially improve screening decisions by unearthing predictors of applicant performance that you and I or humans might easily miss. 
Now, the traditional hiring algorithms look for characteristics of a job applicant that predict future success based on historical training data set of applicants who have already been interviewed or hired in the past. This type of approach known as supervised or using supervised learning works well when firms have a lot of data on past applicants and when the qualities that predict past success continue to predict future success. However, there are many, many instances when both these assumptions may not be true. For example, uh, applicants from non-traditional backgrounds may in fact be underrepresented in the training data set. Th this makes it more difficult for firms to accurately predict their performance. Moreover, and importantly, skill demands might change over time. Firms hiring workers today, for example, may place more emphasis on an employee's ability to work effectively in a remote setting than they did six or nine months ago. Now, our MIT colleague, Associate Professor, uh, Professor Danielle Lee, in her recent paper, Hiring as Exploration, and, and I think Lauren and the team will share a link to this, looked at the way algorithm design impacts uh, upon access to opportunity. To address this, Lee and her team looked at hiring as a dynamic learning problem, analyzing applicants based on their upside potential or option value. The team's algorithm assigns what it called an exploration bonus to identify candidates whose quality the firm knows the least about. These candidates might be rare based on their educational background, work history or demographics, but they all share one thing in common. Because the firm knows so little about them, it stands to learn the most from giving them a chance. This is referred to as hiring as exploration, since as, as Lee herself puts it, you never know if you don't try. So Lee and her uh, co-authors, Raymond and Bourbon, applied the dynamic learning algorithm to a data sample of nearly 90,000 job applications at, that a single for, Fortune 500 company received over the span of 40 months. The researchers compared their output, the exploration-oriented model, to the output of two types of static learning algorithms, one that never changed and one that was updated after a round of 100 applicants. Th those were the supervised learning models and to the firm's ultimate interview and hiring decisions. Now, this, this particular firm was very selective. It rejected approximately 95% of candidates based on its initial resume screen and only 10% of the candidates who passed the screening accepted a job offer. Under the exploration-based algorithm, 25% of candidates selected for an interview were in fact hired, up from 10% when using the human recruiters. Using the supervised learning models, approximately 2% of the applicants who passed the initial resume uh, screening were black uh, and less than 5% were Hispanic. Under the exploration-oriented model, the shares rose to 14% and 10% respectively. So one thing that, that I noticed when, when kind of reading Danielle Lee's uh, paper was that uh, references made to the ability of business functions to interface effectively and comfortably with technology. And I, I just thought that might be, it might be an interesting kind of point uh, juncture in today's presentation, just to make a few uh, high level uh, comments with regard to language and digital language. Now, as, as you kind of read through the slide, I'll, I'll just make a few, few points here. The, the first one is with regard to what is the actual function of language. Now, the, the general assumption is often, or has often been, that its function is to facilitate communication. MIT's uh, Noam Chomsky challenges this, in fact, and, and suggests that the function of language is to link interface conditions. Th this, I think, is very, very interesting because at a time where the fundamental human and machine relationships are being recalibrated by machine learning and transformative technologies, I think we're creating significant new interfaces and new interface conditions between humans and machines and humans and humans also as well. And as such, we should think about language and how we use it in a digital and algorithmic context in our teams and organization. Whether those teams are actually uh, technical or non-technical, uh, compromised or, or, or comprised of um, 
humans or machines only, or perhaps as is more likely, are teams of both humans and machines working together. Now, I think when it comes to this conversation of digital language, it's more than a case of learning digital vocabulary, a digital lexicon, or even a digital syntax. It's thinking about the what, where, when, and why of how we interface with technology. Now, I, I think we might even go as far as to kind of think of digital language as an organizational capability. Perhaps even an algorithm, the, the early stages of an algorithmic version of the three R's we grew up with in the industrial revolution, reading, writing, and arithmetic. In today's, and I think tomorrow's organizations, we're gonna to need to have more human and machine translators in our organizations. Those people ready and willing to convert computer science into business value, to act almost as modems between technical and non-technical teams, or perhaps more accurately, in today's business reality where we are all somewhat nerdish, to create a more efficient flow of information, knowledge, and experience in our organizations and communities. Now, I'm sure all of us on, on, on this call today having this conversation, um, we, we know that learning to speak a, a new language or a second language can be really intimidating. Um, one, one thing that might be interesting to, to do is, is to think about um, how children, in fact, learn language. Um, it grows in their heads. If you, if you put a young child in an environment where, they're, where people are speaking a language or they can hear the language, the child will naturally pick it up, pick up that language. They'll have to be taught how to, uh, to, to read and write, but they'll pick, up, they'll pick up the language. The learning we might take from this, I'd argue, is that in our organizations, we need to foster and facilitate the opportunities for our people to pick up and use digital vocabulary, syntax, and language without fear of failure or censure. As we journey further into the second half of the technology chessboard, we'll, we'll all have more opportunities and requirements to interface with technology. So hanging out and speaking with people across our organization who have a different fluency in the building blocks of digital language is probably a wise and kind of good idea. So this leads me now into kind of talking for a few minutes, uh, conscious that we need to get on to questions as, as well. Um, just a, a few, talk for a few minutes about some of the key points with regard to almost a, a 3E approach uh, of exploring, experimenting and evolving with algorithmic business thinking. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna talk through every single one of, the, of these bullet points you, you'll be pleased to hear, but I'll, I'll just kind of reference what, what I think are a couple of uh, important points. Um, Recently, not wishing to name drop, we had the opportunity to do some work with NASA and uh, Jim Garvin, the chief scientist there, has this kind of, um, ha has this kind of term forever frontier. And, and I thought it was kind of poetic and super useful at the same time. Um, for those of us who've been working um, in organizations for, for you know, more than three or four years perhaps, um, but kind of you know, 10, 15, 20 years, um, we might remember a time where we used to make products and we would kind of finalize it, put them in a box, put a ribbon on it, a bow and send it all out as a finished article. Um, today, whether we're talking about hardware or software, the, 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 the true reality of this is that design and product development never truly finishes. You will never completely have something that's the finished article. We live in a forever frontier in the digital economy. We use data for continuous improvements. We're always learning, always thinking about where we go to next. Yes, we, we've, we've seen kind of a, a transition from analog to, to digital. The point that I want to make here, and um, the key point for, for me personally, is that exploration is very important, um, not just because of the discoveries and the interconnections, but the inspiration that it kind of drives. Um, exploring is exciting. <laughs> uh, th think back to when we were all kind of children. Uh, wow, visiting new countries, going to new places, uh, building bridges, crossing them, taking those steps into, into the unknown. Uh, these are the types of things that give, give you a, a spark of kind of inspiration that leads to innovation and discoveries. If we can inspire ourselves and our teams, um, lots of other things become a little bit more natural and easy. With regard to experimenting, we've got a, a number of kind of bullet points here. Um, 
as, as, as you kind of look through them, I'll, I'll kind of draw attention to one or two. Um, team of teams is, is, is one that I'd like to reference. By this, I mean creating, um, creating diverse teams, uh, small core teams made up of people that aren't necessarily uh, the people you hang out with in your reporting line around the coffee machine or the water cooler, but actually picking a, a diverse group of people with a shared, uh, a shared objective and a shared mission. Um, team of teams can be challenging because collaboration, when it's done correctly, is very difficult, isn't it? You know, I, I often think there are two, at least two levels or two types of collaboration. There's the risk-free stuff, which is all very nice. And then there's the risk sharing. And what I'm suggesting is that we should kind of go for the risk sharing option where we find ways to actually collaborate with people outside of our reporting lines to experiment with them, use the diversity of those teams to be the spark for, for innovation and to move us all forward. And um, then the final point on here that I'd like to mention is that is the last bullet point around being human, about caring more. Um, so, you know, here at MIT Sloan in the Office of Executive Education, we've explored and kind of experimented our way forward to create the, 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 you know, the future we have today, so, so to speak. Um, after everything we've done, the hundreds of experiments, the, you know, the, the, the failings, the, the, the regroupings, the kind of getting back on the bicycle, the development, all of these things, that the one thing that I've taken from this as being key is to care. You have to care. If you want to be brilliant at, at, at what you do, you have to care more than your competitors do. You have to care more about the product, the service, the experience, what you're building, what it's going to do for people. And you have to care more about, about your teams. And I would also argue in a time of, of COVID, very seriously today, it might be kind of something most people don't do, but you've got to care about yourself. Yeah, you, you have to kind of take some steps to, for, for your own physical, your own mental well-being and, and be kind to yourself. None of us are superhuman. You, you have to kind of get that extra bit of sleep. You have to go for that walk. You have to kind of do the things so that you're going to be there for the people who might need you in your teams or in your family. Then with regard to, to evolving, um, all I would like to say here is, is that I actually see this very often in, in, in terms of a double helix where the double helix structure, kind of the ladder um, that represents the, the digit, the, the, two, the two kind of ladder parts of the strands uh, represents the digital world and the physical worlds we actually live within. And then the rungs of the ladder are actually algorithms. Uh, our physical and digital worlds are being linked. We are evolving um, based on the linkages of algorithms between uh, our, our physical world and our digital world. Um, final thing to say here is around consilience. Um, I've borrowed this kind of term from E.O. Wilson, uh, his, his book, Consilience. Um, unification, unity. Um, when, we, when we come out of um, the, the COVID situation, our, our kind of digital world is gonna be more human and our human world is gonna be more digitized. Um, hardware, software, hardware, yeah? We, we're gonna be a combination of both. We were before, but now we're gonna know it and we're gonna be striving and moving towards it in, in new ways. So given that kind of structure of the double helix, algorithmic business thinking, uh, I think is a key component of how we're gonna, how, how we're gonna move forward in the digital economy. So super, super, super conscious, 30 seconds more here. So what, what have we talked about everybody? We've, we've talked about the, the cornerstones of algorithmic business thinking borrowed from computational thinking. We tried to give a sense of where we are with technology, how we got here. We've shared how we kind of suffer and maybe get through the 3.30 a.m. or p.m. problem. Shared the UDAP framework. Shared Daniela's, Daniela Lee's work on hiring as exploration. Started to think a little bit about digital language and, and kind of importantly, exploration, experimentation, evolution as we kind of move forward. So. Right now, I've got nothing else to say than a big thank you for all of your patience as you've listened to me. Um, and I think I'll hand it back to the team and see if we have any questions. Uh, thank you, Paul. There's been uh, a great discussion going on in the chat and a lot of questions coming in. Uh, in the, the last um, 10 minutes, I'll try to uh, paraphrase a few of those. One uh, overriding set of questions, I think, has to do with, so how much knowledge or capability about uh, 
digital technology or technology more broadly, do you think from your work that non-technology people need to have in order for these conversations, for this language to be able to, uh, these two languages to be able to communicate uh, with, with, with each other? What have you seen from things like the Unicon experiment, for example? Yes, so for, I'll, I'll reference the Unicon. Thank you, Peter, it's a great question. So um, I'll reference the Unicon example and then kind of share a couple of other thoughts perhaps. So um, frankly, I, I don't think there is any kind of mathematical uh, technology or, um, or coding or programming kind of foundation that's required. I think it, it's, um, it's more to do with human elements, okay? I, I think um, a curiosity, uh, a willingness to, to, to explore and to experiment and, and, and to evolve, um, a creativity as, as, as well. I think what, what one of the things I learned from the Unicorn experience is that it's, it's kind of funny, there's, there's a paradox here that um, we, we look and we spend so much time kind of working with machine learning and, and other technologies that the reality is that it's actually the user experience today that hasn't caught up with the technology capability. So I think curiosity and creativity coupled with the critical thinking of algorithmic business thinking it is kind of a pretty useful formula move, moving forward. Uh, great, thank you, that, that makes sense. Moving, moving on, uh, there were a lot of questions as you were, you were uh, going through that were comparing some of the ideas and the tools you're using to uh, frameworks like systems thinking, design thinking, uh, and I'm guessing, you know, those are just some of the uh, tools in your kit that you have packed into your suitcase. Uh, but I'm just wondering how you think about uh, you know, integrating and interfacing with all of those existing uh, tools and frameworks and ideas. Uh, and can we use those to help us in, al in algorithmic business thinking? Yeah, I, th I think so. And again, great, great, great question and great kind of it's so important for us to think about this. The, the, the analogy in my mind, um, I, I remember kind of when, when I was a child, kind of um, my, my father's workshop um, and we would go, myself and my brothers would go downstairs to kind of where he was working and all along the walls, there were kind of chisels of every type, there were drill bits of every type, there were kind of uh, tools of, of, of every type. And I think algorithmic business thinking is, is simply that, it's, it's, it's a toolkit, a combination of of frameworks, research insights, questions, okay? Um, and depending on the job that we need, we're gonna take a different chisel off the wall. We're gonna take a different um, framework. We're gonna apply different, um, different experiences. So one thing I should have said is that algorithmic business thinking doesn't pretend to be a silver bullet of, of any sort. It's an opportunity to take a couple of steps back and provide some perspective, zoom in and zoom out of problems and apply the tools and the questions and the frameworks that are needed in a given case. Excellent, uh, thank you. So just re reviewing some more of the, uh, the questions here. I think there's a lot of discussion about, uh, I mean, you, you identified it, uh, the uh, difference that there is between people who view themselves as being in tech uh, and, and frankly, people who don't, uh, or don't have that background uh, or, or, or experience. Um, you've talked about some examples, but I think people have been discussing a lot. What are the things that people can practically do that you've seen, whichever side uh, of that uh, chasm that they feel that they're on? So I, th I think this concept of, of, of modems or translators is, is, is important. And Sincerely, that this isn't meant to be kind of a, a gratuitous kind of plug for, for, for the work that we do at MIT Sloan or in, in executive education. But the, the example that comes to mind is, you know, we've built a portfolio of 25 to 30 kind of um, asynchronous online programs. We also, you know, we have, as everybody I'm sure knows, we, we have a series of kind of live online kind of experiences as well. And we, we live, don't we? And I'm sure kind of the vast majority of, of our participants as, as well here live on this intersect between technology and management, okay? And so in our programs, we're very much looking to translate that computer science and data science into opportunities to create new, new business value. So I think it's about being curious again, about digging into research papers, be very careful what, what you read, what you select to read, go as far as you can if, if you don't have the, the mathematical and technical background, 
but then always take that step back and think, well, what does this actually mean? Um, why, why is this useful? It's about, it's perhaps more about asking ourselves questions than it is kind of finding the answers, okay? So yeah, spend time around technology, um, be curious, be, be, be willing to kind of fall off your bike a, a little bit. Go back to the analogy of language. We, you, we all remember, you know, learning French, then kind of winding up in Paris and kind of nobody being able to understand us as, as, we, as we ordered our kind of cafe au lait. You, you, have, you have to try, you, you have to persevere. You, ha you have to keep going. We, we hear a lot about resilience, don't we, today? But that's always gonna be an important kind of characteristic. So I think it's about hanging out with technologies and, and that doesn't mean necessarily your IT and R&D departments, but it's about starting conversations uh, within your function. Look, look at Daniela Lee's work, that, that's in HR. There are lo loads and loads of examples in, in, in finance, in, in marketing, in sales and recruitment. Um, so it's, it's all there, it's just about having the conversation, Peter, I think. So I took from that answer as well, the, the observation that if it's not happening in our own organizations, uh, we can be pretty sure it's happening somewhere else. Uh, and we can both use those as examples to learn from, but they should also light a bit of a fire under us because uh, we may get, be overtaken by uh, those uh, other organizations if we're not uh, posting ourselves on these challenges too. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, well, th 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 thank you for kind of so succinctly kind of summarizing <laughs> some, summarizing the point, but it, it, another analogy is to kind of think about the, the juxtaposition or the, the paradox or the tension between uh, the principles of the industrial age that we, we came from and the, the digital age in which we're in today. I mentioned around the transition from a one size fits all to a personalized solution. Um, I think that that's super important. We, we, each one of us has to find what works well for, for, for us. We, we can't, um, not that we ever would, but we can't abdicate a responsibility to the machines <laughs> or, or to kind of uh, in, incumbent kind of approaches or philosophies. We, we, we have to kind of be curious and, and find out what, what's, what's out there and, and see how it's gonna be useful for us. Great, uh, thank you, Paul. I think that's a, a very uh, inspiring thought to, uh, I was gonna say end on, but as you've told us, this is a never ending journey. Uh, so just to take a short break, uh, and I'm sure we'll be back again in future to delve deeper into uh, this subject matter. And as Paul has mentioned, uh, we have uh, many uh, courses and programs that Paul has helped us develop and many others at uh, MIT Sloan Executive Education that I think I would encourage us all to take a look at and see how we can see those as all tools uh, that we can add to our toolkit uh, to help us be better at Algorithmus, algorithmic business thinking now that we have that idea in our head. So thank you very much, Paul. It looks like you have one last thing that you would like to say. So please go ahead. My, 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 my joke, yeah? Ah, yes. <laughs> so why is it that robots are such good dancers? I don't know. Why are robots such good dancers? Because they have algorithms. <laughs> That's think, also a linguistic joke. I think there was a bit of... Uh, non-English uh, interpretation in that as well. So on that note, I think that might be our first formal joke in any of our Innovation at Work webinars. So thank you, Paul, for that innovation. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you again uh, in uh, future iterations of the Innovation at Work webinar series. Now we have both uh, this deep dive format that takes 60 minutes, uh, looking deeper into subjects, as well as we will continue uh, with our now popular 30 minute need to know uh, format. Uh, we will be uh, providing a recording and uh, slides from today's presentation. And please watch this space uh, as the saying goes for future webinars and courses coming from MIT Sloan Executive Education. Thank you to the whole team uh, for working behind the scenes to make this happen. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, keep on innovating and uh, keep on thinking algorithmically about your businesses. Thank you.